Hello guys, this is Jenny from Nordic Top Line and welcome to follow our video series. Our today's guest is international Grand Prix dressage writer Sarah Siohon Patience. Welcome Sarah and would you please introduce yourself a little bit and tell your story how you started training horses and a little bit about your background. Sure. So my name is Sarah Shahon Patience. I am a Canadian dressage rider that's based in the UK at the moment, having spent a lot of time working in Europe, but also some time in Australia and uh, America working there as well. Um, I don't know that I actually had a moment where I chose this as a career. I think that was kind of always really sitting in the background. I think, um, yeah, horses were something I wanted to do from the beginning. I uh, you know, all the photos of my birthday parties were at pony parties because that's what I begged for when I was younger. I read all the horse books in the library and then when we moved, I, I repeated the process again, sometimes a couple of times over and began a, a long and hard campaign with my parents to start um, some riding lessons. And finally, they cracked at 10 and um, then fortunately really sided, sided on. So when uh, we moved back to Canada again, um, having spent some time abroad, um, I then ended up um, getting a horse with a more natural horsemanship type of, of, of lady who basically bought this horse. And I was going to be a show jumper. That was, you know, I was going to be the next Ian Miller, who was at the time winning the World Cup. Um, with his famous horse Big Ben, so that was that was going to be my path. And I think my mother and and my um, trainer at the time took one one note of that one, and, and my mom said too dangerous. So um, the horse that they got for me apparently was not for jumping, um, and that started kind of the dressage journey of the of the whole thing. So I was fortunate enough that even though she was a little quarter horse, she learned how to do the movements from medium level dressage at the time in Canada, which was the laterals and the flying change each way. And, um, and then I was hooked um, and did young riders there, had a couple of different horses, always had very good trainers. So I had the really good fortune of working with uh, a couple of Canadian Olympians and also with uh, Dietrich von Hopfgarten, who basically trained most of the people in North America, at least on the West Coast, that are currently um, out and successful at my age and above, obviously. <laughs> um, and uh, at a certain point decided that, yes, I was going to try and have a go at, at going pro. Um, so got a working student job over in Germany, um, working for a trainer called Leonie Brommel, who was an Olympian herself and had spent 18 years working for Johann Hinnemann. And I mucked a lot of straw stables and I rode a lot of horses and that, <laughs> that evolved then into helping some of the riders there um, and um, then moving on and, and taking a little break, going over and training some of the ones that I've been helping in Australia and, um, and uh, in California before deciding I'm not good enough. I need to go back and do more and uh, was lucky enough to land a job with uh, Klaus Falkenhall. Um, and so spent a couple of years working for him. And then when the yard was downsizing, then found, uh, found other work over in Switzerland and then stumbled over to the UK and discovered that I really like a guy with a British accent. So <laughs> here I am living in the UK with a now lovely daughter. Um, I've run training stables over here. I coach a bunch of different riders. I've had the good fortune of going up and riding some international Grand Prix tests and working with horses of all sorts of different levels. I think that was all the question contained but I, I got lost in my own story <laughs> <laughs> no that's that's really cool I mean you have a long carry with horses really interesting I don't I'm not sure if I've ever heard this long version from this but it, it, I, I can find some similarities from the beginning especially <laughs> mm. uh, but yeah what would be interesting to hear uh, what are the kind of a basic training principles you use with the horses and how do you start when you start training with a new horse how do you start with with the process 
Sure. So, I mean, I think the big thing that uh, kind of underlines all of my training is that the horses have to understand what we're looking for. Um, so it's making sure that the basic communication is consistent and that we are delivering it in a way where we're outlining for them what we expect. Um, my, my most of my experience says that if we present it in a way where horses can do it and they understand what we want, we will get that. Um, and then it's just a matter of developing both their, their skill set and their physical ability. So um, I work a lot using the uh, German training scale, um, working up, um, for those who aren't familiar, it's, it's definitely worth Google. Um, it you know, gives a set of six different priorities and working particularly for the lower level horses with the bottom three of rhythm, suppleness, and then contact really gives a good guideline and a good starting point for where horses are. Um, if I get a new one in training, for example, which I think is what you're asking, um, then I, I usually like to try and figure out where exactly they're at and what, what they know. Um, and, and obviously, I'm going to be asking in a way that's probably different than they're used to. So it's how do they deal with the challenge? You know, can you, you know, the most important ones, can you stop and can you go somewhere? Can you go faster? Can you go slower? Um, and then you want to add in, can you bend and can you go then ideally sideways? And a combination of all of those ones will eventually take you up to Grand Prix. So, um, yeah, I think I think that is that's it. Figure out where you're going, um, and find a consistent way of explaining to the horse what what it is you're after. Yeah, and I think the next question is a little bit uh, uh, similar with this one. I mean, I'm sure you have a lot of clients who comes to you with a difficult horse. Um, so, what do you think? Where does the problems uh, come from? I mean, usually the horses will do what they understand. So uh, there's oftentimes there's pain that's involved or there's a lack of parity um, or they're being asked to do something that physically they're not ready to do yet. Um, so, yeah, the, the pain that could come from all sorts of different places. And it is always worth if you find a resistance, having a vet or a professional, at least check your horse over, um, making sure the saddle and the, the equipment fit, making sure the farrier is right so that the horse is in a good has a, has a physical condition to do what you're asking. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to say we as humans are perfect, but we tend to be crooked and have less control on one side than another. And half the time I've got a horse that's going, you know, that's problematic going one way. It's actually the, the rider that is unintentionally creating the issue. Um, and then, you know, our physical development, it takes them time to be strong enough to execute some of the, move, the moves. Um, and so sometimes just taking the level that you're working at back a little bit. So perhaps asking for a, a you know, moving away from even working for the laterals and just working on simple bend and balance on a circle, for example. If they can't balance on a 10 meter circle, it's not going to be better in the shoulder in. It's yeah, that you're you're carrying forward a problem rather than actually anything else. Yeah, so yeah. it comes all, all down yeah. to the basics. And then yeah. what I see a lot is that, you know, the horse isn't understanding what the rider really wants. And I think it. the problem with communication is, is often something that creates problems. Mm -hmm. But that's something you also answered in the, in the first question a bit. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, I think it all comes down to that. And I think there was a, I think I saw it on Facebook, a great analogy for it, where it said, um, you know, a, a beginning rider is working on intermediate moves to try and become an intermediate rider. An intermediate rider is busy practicing the advanced moves to try and become an advanced rider. And an advanced rider is working on the basics. Um, and I think that's really poignant. Um, and I think, you know, Classically, when people tell me what level they're at, you know, they'll say, oh, I've ridden medium. And actually, that doesn't give me a full description of their riding ability because someone can perhaps never have ridden a horse sideways, but they have excellent communication with the horse. And they will, in that sense, possibly be better than a rider who might not um, really have that communication portion, but have managed to push a particular horse sideways and and maybe for a flying change or something like that. So I think the ability to communicate with the horses and to have that awareness and perception of our own bodies to be able to deliver that consistently is what makes a good rider. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, and then the one thing is um, like, what kind of exercises would you use to straighten the horse 
and uh, the exercises you would use to give courses supple. I think that's one of the questions I often hear from, from people asking for me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, the suppleness, I, I like, even though it's the second step of the training scale, I like the, the law skill and height that the Germans refer to, which also talks about relaxation in it. Yeah. Um, because I think you know, we have to double check that we've actually got that element in it if we want our horses to be supple. Um, and then it's defining where the challenge is as well, because horses can be, um, you know, laterally supple. So you can bend them one side or another, but longitudinally not so much. So you, you can't actually change and vary the pace very much or, or change the frame length very much. Mm -hmm. um, so it, picking one where your area of struggle is, or if it's all of them, then you have more of them. Um, but traditionally kind of using um, curved lines, um, using clarity of your, of your aiding for it, um, so that you're actually not just forcing the horse into a position we we, we, we want to try and avoid that one you're know, in the same way as an athletic development for a human um you know, if you're trying to stretch something out you don't just yank on it and pull 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 pull, pull and, and and wiggle it around and hope that all of a sudden you can do the splits it's, it's not going to happen you've got to work it as a progression yeah um and you know transitions to help with the longitudinal suppleness and again, looking at, at different ways of working the horse as well. So some groundwork is a phenomenal way of working on it. Um, getting yields, um, turns in the forehand, you know, depending on what level the horse is at and, and where the struggle point is. Um, rain backs, um, carrot stretches by themselves can be mm -hmm. a fantastic way. So, you know, there's, there's so many different options on how we're doing things that there isn't one set exercise that's that's going to answer that question we want to look at it and approach it from a really dynamic and and comprehensive point really yeah and look look at the horse and what, what the horse really needs yeah absolutely yeah. and i mean uh, also the suppleness and the straightness they tie together so if yeah. your horse can bend well both ways it's chances are that there's going to be a degree of straightness I think, um, yeah, I mean, straightness is a needs, the horse needs to be going forward enough. You need a, a, a variety of different tools, but really when they're going well, um, if, you've, if you've done the, the portions beneath it well, you're mm. going to be slowly running out of things that will, will be making them go crooked unless you've either got a physical issue or you yourself are sitting crooked. Yeah, yeah really good points um then there's one question i hear also very often and that's like what kind of a basic training plan do you have for your horses or what do you follow is it like you train two days and then have one launching day or something like that I think that depends a lot on the horse. So yeah. um, the younger they are, the less proper training days I'd have and the more cross training they would be involved in it. Um, so you know, perhaps if it's, a, if it's a young horse that's reasonably recently backed, I might do a, a ride and then something unmounted the next day. Um, and then followed possibly by a hack or another ride or whatever, um, and slowly then working it up. Um, and with my higher level competition horses, probably training four times a week and varying that one. You know, if they're working at an international level, they may have to do the test three days in a row. So if you only ever train two days in a row, then you can end up with a horse that's not actually fit enough to do the job. Um, but it's that avoiding the kind of constant wear and tear and the repetitive strain portion of it. So working on different exercises and, and having a training focus for each of the days and making sure you're mixing and matching it so that you are taking them out for hacks. You are working maybe some pole work, maybe working a bit in hand. Um, Lunging is also great if you're doing it in a non-long, long duration type of time. It's been, I think, proven to be lameness um prevention um so yeah there's all sorts of different different ways of approaching you know, the athletic training of the horse and some of it is which one suits which you know there's I had one horse that i was working with and if you weren't doing something written every day the performance slipped dramatically and another one that could have three days of of poodling around on a hack and be ready to do a test the next day so it's working with the horse as an individual as well and then um, one thing we both know very well, you always need a team around you if you want to succeed in something. <laughs> but I would yeah. like to hear from you. 
So what is really needed if you want to succeed in writing? What would you what would be your tips to to the writers and the listeners we have today? In terms of team or in terms of other tips? As <laughs> you can you can give all the tips you have in your mind because I know I know there's probably a lot. <laughs> um, so in terms of team, I think that's that I mean that one's you if they if if everyone's working to a degree complementary you can't even have a big enough team um so you know working at a at a kind of lower competition level you want to have a decent relationship with your vet your farrier um whoever's managing the stable if you don't have them at home um you need to have at least a coach because none of us can do this on our own um and you may actually have then additional coaches that are brought in for either particular portions or also as a different set of eyes so that you're getting a, a different viewpoint on it um you, you're going to need transport and perhaps probably some help at the competitions um then you probably want to add in a, a complementary to the vet um some some body treatment for the horses and also for yourself um you want to make sure that you're doing some sort of physical training for it so if you know at the at the lower levels it's probably perfectly sufficient to be working um you know either working videos from youtube or um or just a general um all-purpose training regime and then the more advanced and you'll need a saddle fitter at some point as well because the, the fit of the saddle will impact the horse and then you know, the the higher the performance level you want you want to start looking at potentially getting a sports psychologist involved potentially yeah. nutritionist both for yourself and for your horse you definitely want to be having body workers on both yourself and the horse regularly and ideally having them also corresponding with the farrier and the saddle fitter so that they're working together as a team and then you want your coaching to be on a more um involved level i think as, as a sport, we have a bit of a tendency to go to this one session type of a, a model where we go and we have a training session and then we go home and we work on it on our own until the next training session. And really, as you start to get more advanced, being able to have someone that you can bounce ideas off of you know, or send a video to and just say, hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this one or what do you think of this one? I think I'm on the right track is invaluable. Um, and at the top, top level, you know, the, the, the difference between the percentages is so small that you know, they're working under the eye of somebody almost all the time. That doesn't necessarily mean in the structured session, but just that there's always that extra step to go, hey, you can ask a little more, or oh, that's too much, or I think you know, need more angles so that, that refinement comes really into the, into the whole picture. Um, yes. And in terms of general tips, I think the biggest tip I can give is look at systems and processes and, and developing a pattern for what it is that works for you and going in and finding interest in what works for you and what works for your horse rather than focusing on results or levels or anything like that. Because if you keep the, the gain or the, the, uh, the focus on how how it's all working and what you can maybe do to improve things you're always going to be both on a positive and also having a a a a, a, a measure of success that's within your own control yeah there's a lot of tips and i think like you said it, it's good to have like someone to be able to see how you're improving and how you're writing and i think the like the modern times when you can have all the time like some like your phone video in your writing sessions and you can always ask someone to check if things are going in the right way so that's that's a good thing in, in that in nowadays perfect so really nice um then one thing i of course want all the listeners to know is like where to find you and if they want to train with you what can they do <laughs> Um, so I have a few different options on, on finding me. I have a website, sarahshowhomepatients.com, which is half impossible to spell, possibly not so bad up north, but, but certainly here. Um, so probably follow links on, on, on the video. Um, I'm also on social media, um, I, at showhomepatients. Um, so on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, although less so than I probably should be. And um, um, I also have a YouTube channel as well that we'll be having some videos posted on it. 
Um, oh, looking forward. Cool. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> getting there, getting there. Technology. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's it. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah, perfect. So, and if they, if people are looking to train with me, um, I do clinics at the moment with the, the COVID situation. I'm pretty much restricted to just working inside the UK. Um, so I do clinics across the UK. Um, and then usually, um, or before COVID, I was doing regular clinics over in Finland and um, also in Germany. So um, contacting me to you know, just send me a message. I'd, I'd be interested in setting up a clinic um, and training that way. Or as you mentioned, with new technology, mm. I'm on RideSum, so that offers the ability of a digital lesson. Um, yeah. Or um, yeah, the pl plenty of different options, really. <laughs> Okay, really nice. Well, thank you so much for coming to an interview. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have a chat with you. I hope our, our listeners are going to get a lot from the, from the interview. So thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>